for abolitionism because this is the moment where abolitionism goes from being a really tiny fringe movement that is for the most part rooted, not exclusively, but again, for the most part in the Quaker church, becoming a much broader movement, which really is national in scope and also implications. In the 1820s, and again, especially in the 1830s, accelerating in the 1840s, a number of Americans, most of them looking to this Second Great Awakening, a part of this Second Great Awakening, seized by this new spirituality, this new religiosity, these Americans begin looking around the country, and they say to themselves, this country, great though it might be, can be much greater. And in fact, in many ways, is deeply troubled. And they look at a number of different facets of the American scene, and they say to themselves, if we want to perfect our souls, we must also begin to think about perfecting the collective soul of the nation, redeeming this nation which sinned from its birth, and somehow improving it in the eyes of God. They seize on a number of different initiatives in these years. Again, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, you have people who are advocating for temperance. No more consumption of alcohol, or at least a greatly reduced consumption of alcohol in the United States. You have Sabbatarians, people who are arguing that the Sabbath must be kept holy, that it must be a day of contemplation, of reverence. You have people who are advocating for common schools or public schools. And increasingly, you have what we think of, what we describe as abolitionists. People who are involved in a social movement that is founded on the principle that abolitionism is staining the nation's soul. That it is a cancer in the body politic, that it must be cut out. Now these people, it is absolutely critical to understand. In this period, even as late as the 1840s, they are still a very, very small they are a friend. They are on the margins of American society and politics. When they travel to speak, they are often scorned. When they print leaflets, their presses, in some instances, are taken from them and thrown in the Ohio River. Uh, when they, uh, when they, they try and, and, and send notices through the mails, uh, their letters are censored. Some of them are jailed. Others are tarred and feathered. Some are killed. Nevertheless, they believe deeply enough in the principles of their movement. They believe that what they are fighting for is so central to the health of the United States, so central to somehow improving the health and well-being of the body politic that they continue to organize in the face of extraordinary danger. Despite the fact that they are ridiculed and marginalized, they keep on. They keep on struggling. Now, in these years, for a variety of different reasons, the United States acquires an enormous amount of new territory. It does this by ginning up a series of wars and conflicts, 
He does this by taking land from native people. Look at Johnny about this stuff. I'm sorry. <laughs> This is Professor Sadler. He'll be speaking later in the week. I'll be coming and laughing during his presentation. I assure you. Uh, the United States does this, and it acquires a great deal of new land in what we now would think of as the West. Uh, it acquires this land from Mexico. It acquires this land from Britain, in some instances from Russia. When this land is brought into the United States, it precipitates a crisis. Over the first half century of the United States' existence, for the most part, it had been possible for most Americans to ignore the issue of slavery. Again, not for abolitionists, and that's not to say there weren't certain moments of crisis, but for the most part, Americans were able to forge a series of compromises that allowed them to ignore this great discontinuity between the principles of the nation and between the lived reality of daily life in the United States. But with the acquisition of all of this new territory, a burning question arises, and that question is, will slavery be allowed to spread into the West? It is in that moment that abolitionists move to the center rather than the periphery of American politics. How do they do this? In large measure because the leading abolitionists of the day understand certain critical elements of American culture and because other leading abolitionists are willing again to put themselves in harm's way. So probably the most famous example of this would be Henry David Thoreau, who in the run-up to the United States' war with Mexico, a war that brings approximately a third of the size of the United States into the nation, in the run-up to that war with Mexico, Henry David Thoreau decides that he simply will not pay his taxes anymore. Not only will he not pay his taxes anymore, but he's going to make sure that people in authority know that he is not going to pay his taxes anymore. He's going to make sure that he is jailed. He then writes an essay on civil disobedience, an essay that I expect many of you have read, an essay that becomes one of the foundations for Mahatma Gandhi, for Martin Luther King, for other moments of civil disobedience in this nation's history, including, as I understand it, the Occupy League. In On Civil Disobedience, Henry David Thoreau makes one point quite explicit. He says, when a law is unjust, you must, as a just and engaged citizen of a republic, challenge that law. Thoreau refuses to pay his taxes, he goes to jail, he becomes a kind of national celebrity. He'd already been a writer of some note, he'd run in the right literary circles, but he elevates himself into a figure of real national standing. And around the same time, other abolitionists challenge, challenge those people who would like to see slavery spread into these newly acquired territories. They advocate for turning that territory into what they describe as free soil. Free soil. And some abolitionists begin to engage with a political process that they recognize as corrupt, but they believe it is important to organize from within that process. They start a national political party known as the Free Soil Party, a party that is dedicated to the proposition not that African Americans should have equal rights, not that slavery must be abolished immediately, but instead that this new territory will remain free soil. Wow. Important thing to understand in these years is that abolitionists refuse to remain silent. And in fact, whenever an opportunity to force a confrontation presents itself, they do so. They do so nonviolently, but they refuse. They refuse to be cast to the margins. And again, even in these years, even in the late 1840s and into the 1850s, as I describe abolitionism moving to the center of American politics, it remains a very small movement. 
How many people in these years would have described themselves as abolitionists? We don't have accurate figures, but it probably would have been in the hundreds or the thousands. This is a tiny, tiny minority of the American population, and yet it is wielding extraordinary cultural power. Why? Because it will not remain silent, because it is making a compelling moral argument in these years. As the United States in the 1850s moves toward the Civil War, the abolitionist movement becomes more and more powerful, more and more vocal, even as, it's important to understand, the movement itself is splintering. The abolitionist movement, like so many other mass movements in United, uh, the history of this country, has an extremely difficult time remaining united. It is divided over issues of class, divided over issues of gender, divided over issues of race. Who should be leaders within this movement? Should women be allowed to speak in public? Should African Americans be at the forefront or in the background of this movement? The movement is fragmenting over all of these internal divisions, and yet, in important ways, it remains united over one major issue, and that is that slavery must be eradicated. By the middle of the 1850s, the federal government is finding it increasingly difficult to craft compromises. It is finding it increasingly difficult to hold a nation together that is divided between free states and slave states. And abolitionists in these years continue to apply extraordinary pressure. Some even, by the late 1850s, are elected to the United States Senate, where they give extraordinarily incendiary speeches where in some instances, including in the Western Territories, in the case of Kansas, abolitionists like John Brown will travel and they will try to hasten. They will try to precipitate to bring on a civil war that they believe is inevitable. The only way these radical aboli abolitionists believe... The author of... Saturday morning, breakfast cereal, breakfast cereal, is in Wellman 2. Feel free to join his lecture. Feel free to join his lecture. I have a vision of a university at this point where, you know, there's basically hundreds of different lectures going on at any given time, and you've got people standing outside sort of uh, uh, crying out, explaining what all of these lectures are, and I just have the sinking sensation that no one would be in mind. <laughs> I know, consumer, there you go. Well, I'll do one. This is good. Uh, at any rate, uh, by the late 1850s, uh, you've got radical abolitionists, including people like John Brown and others, who believe that the only way that the United States can be purified, that the only way that the nation can be redeemed, the only way that this sin can somehow be extinguished, the only way that it can be erased, is if the country is purified in blood. These are people who believe that the United States must be brought into a kind of extraordinary conflict, and only through that sort of conflict will slavery finally be rooted out as an institution. And so it comes to pass. John Brown travels to Kansas, uh, where in 1856 uh, he slaughters a number of pro-slavery uh, uh, people who cross the border. He later tries to lead a slave rebellion, which starts at Harper's Ferry in Virginia. These are critical milestones on the road to the Civil War. Meanwhile, another peaceful, non-violent wing of the abolitionist movement is using other means to continue to heighten the contradictions, to force Americans 
to confront the hypocrisy of living in a nation dedicated to the principles of liberty and freedom in which some individuals own and purchase other individuals. And in that case, you can look at abolitionist authors, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, who wrote extraordinarily uh, well, at the time, not so popular, but who wrote narratives that subsequently have become extraordinarily popular that are taught on this campus. Or, in the moment, if you want to talk about popular writers, you could look at Uncle Tom's Cabin, which at that point becomes the, uh, the, the, the top-selling book. Back to the market, Simon, you'll be pleased. Uh, the top-selling book in the history of the English language other than the Bible. So again, the abolitionist movement has a number of different wings, but all of them ultimately are dedicated to the idea that slavery must be stamped out. And all of them, in one way or another, push the United States toward war. In 1861, the United States blows apart. The Civil War begins. The President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, is elected on a platform in which his party, the Republican Party, a very different Republican Party than today's Republican Party, vows not to allow slavery to spread into the Western United States. Abraham Lincoln, at the beginning of the Civil War, it is critical to understand, is equally dedicated to the proposition that slavery should not be touched where it already exists. Abraham Lincoln is quite clear about this. Slavery should not be allowed to move into the West, but it should not be touched where it's already taken deep root. It is only during the course of the war that abolitionists, senators, and generals push Lincoln over time to embrace the idea that he must emancipate the slaves, that he must Pass, that he, excuse me, that he must hand down his Emancipation Proclamation, which itself is an extraordinarily moderate document, but which ultimately will lead to the passage of the 13th Amendment. Even during the war, even during the war, abolitionists will not be silenced. Time and again, Lincoln pleads, he pleads with abolitionists, pleads, to leave him alone, that he must prosecute the war as he wishes, that he needs their support, that only moderation will allow the nation to reunite, and time and again, abolitionists reject this. They say to him that half measures are insufficient, such that by 1865, by 1865, the United States Congress passes the 13th Amendment, sent to the states, and the slaves forever, one hopes, are free. Again, the takeaway from this story, the takeaway from this story is that an extraordinarily dedicated minority movement, a movement that is made up of elements that are considered really beyond the pale of polite discourse, a movement that is made up of people who are persecuted for their beliefs, a movement of people who are genuinely dedicated to their core principles, can change the country. I can't promise that that kind of change will come without bloodshed. I can't promise that that change will be easy. I can't promise that history offers simple lessons about how these changes take place. In some instances, it takes decades upon decades. But again, history is unequivocal that small groups of people who are dedicated, dedicated to core principles can effect great change. And that's how dissent works in the United States, at least sometimes. Questions? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to take questions. My back. I'm so sorry. Can I sit down? Simon's sitting. Sit down. Simon holding chair. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Go for it. Oh, this is a problem. <laughs> I'll stay. I don't know if anyone has any questions. <laughs>
please. So, so I mean, I'm just trying to look for a bullet, uh, for some bullet points, strategic bullet points. Oh. Yeah. So I'm just going to recap what you're saying. Then it's kind of uh, persistence, even where you can see no end. Uh, core principles that are non-negotiable and yet kind of self-evident, totally reasonable. Um, I mean, that's is that it? I mean, is, is that uh, strategically? Is that so? Si Simon's asking here, Professor Sandler, excuse me, uh, who also I might note has a British accent. Once again, showing me up. Uh, th this side, I'm actually not going to recognize anyone on this side of the, the dome. Uh, Professor Sandler asks, uh, what are the what are the bullet points? He wants an executive summary. I do. Uh, he wants an executive summary of, of what uh, of, of what makes for a success a successful social movement. Uh, and the answer is that, unfortunately, as a historian, I have to tell you that there aren't any bullet points. But I can tell you that from this story, from this you're story. right. Uh, first of all, it is a set of core principles, and you have to be unyielding about those core principles. Second of all, I think it's an ironclad claim to moral authority. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's being able to say of your movement, this yeah. is, a, this is a, a genuinely moral movement based in the idea of bettering society, based in the idea of trying to improve the nation. I would say that an additional core principle really is that you have to be willing to put yourself in harm's way. Uh, I, I, I don't think that people who are members of social movements, particularly social movements that don't start out as mass movements, uh, I, I don't think that they, uh, I think that they have to have real, uh, not just moral, but physical courage. I think that they have to be willing again to put themselves in harm's way. It's, it's, it's a horrible thing, but true, I'm afraid. And then I think that uh, they have to have the courage of their convictions, a willingness to accept ridicule, uh, a willingness to, to, to wait through, to be patient through what, again, in some cases, not months, years, but in some cases can be decades uh, before the movement meets the moment. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a long slog, right? Yeah, so the question is, uh, how, how do slaves play, or do slaves play a critical role in terms of putting uh, pressure uh, on, on people in authority, on entrenched authority figures in terms of moving toward abolition? Uh, the answer is that slaves, I think, play the critical role. Um, both free people, uh, like Frederick Douglass, who becomes a leading member of the abolitionist movement, there are a number of other free people of color who take on leadership roles within the abolitionist movement. Uh, they have a special kind of moral authority. In many instances, it's their stories of liberation and also their own example, the kind of, again, getting back to what Professor Sadler was asking about, moral courage uh, that really is uniquely compelling uh, in moving the country toward embracing emancipation uh, and abolition, ultimately. Um, but then, during the Civil War itself, uh, you see, first it's hundreds, then thousands, ultimately tens of thousands of slaves who cross over, they cross the Union lines, and they force President Lincoln's hand. President Lincoln, early in the war, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you a long historian's answer. You can go to sleep. Uh, <laughs> President Lincoln, early in the war, um, this is probably when you ask people, of, uh, when you ask a scholar, this is really what I actually know about, and so uh, I, I, can't give you, I can't give you the bullet points Simon wants. But early in the war, uh, Lincoln wants nothing more than to not talk about slavery. It, it, it's absolutely critical for the way in which he envisions the early part of the Civil War that slavery not be part of the national discussion. But then, during the war, what happens is a number of slaves, first in Virginia, uh, begin to cross the Union lines. And Lincoln's generals, first in Virginia, but then also out in the West, in Missouri, don't know what to do about these slaves. They don't, they don't want to give them back. And, and they don't want to give them back because some of them are abolitionists, or at least they're anti-slavery, which is to say they're not radical, but they believe that slavery is wrong. They also don't want to give them back because they think these slaves might help the Confederate war effort. They might help the South. 
And so a couple of them begin to say, well, we're not going to give them back. We're going to keep these slaves behind the lines. We're going to put them to work. In some instances, they set up uh, communities in which uh, northern do-gooders, reformers, come down, teach these uh, slaves how to read, how to write, how to cook, a number of different basic skills that they might be able to use, ideally, after the war. But what happens is, is, that, is that as that becomes federal policy, Lincoln finds his hands tied. And then, rather than it being hundreds of slaves, it's thousands of slaves. And then, ultimately, tens of thousands of slaves who cross over the lines, and they push Lincoln further and further toward emancipation. Again, it's not Lincoln who ever says to himself, this is what I want to do. Now, he'll, he'll argue later in the war uh, that in the summer of 1862, he has a series of conversations with God. Maybe that's true. I, I don't know. I wasn't present for the conversations, and, and we don't have good records of them. But what we know unequivocally is that in terms of policy, in terms of the day-to-day -day fighting of the war, Lincoln simply has no choice. Now, you also asked the question about slave rebellions. Slave rebellions were incredibly rare in the United States, and they were rare for a whole host of reasons. Uh, first of all, because uh, uh, the South was relative to the North, sparsely settled, particularly those regions that had uh, large plantations, uh, were, were, were set very, very far apart. It's extremely difficult to communicate over those kinds of distances. Second of all, because uh, Southerners, uh, over time, beginning in the colonial period, but especially uh, in the early national period, in the early years of the nation's history, uh, put in place a number of laws that make it very, very difficult for slaves to organize. Slaves in most southern states aren't allowed to gather in large groups. They're not allowed to learn how to read and write in most southern states. They do behind closed doors. They challenge this authority, but it's very, very difficult. Uh, and then finally, the, the, the threat of violence is so extraordinary. The, the, the dangers of being involved in a, in a slave rebellion are so extraordinary that, that it, it seems in retrospect that the cost-benefit didn't work out very well. And so they're extremely unusual. Uh, that said, the few slave rebellions, the three largest slave rebellions uh, happened in the United States uh, in, in, in the years between 1800 and, uh, and 1832. Uh, and, and those three are absolutely critical in terms of raising people's awareness uh, of some of the conditions uh, under which enslaved people are forced to live. Uh, and also, again, of sort of heightening the contradictions, this sense that a nation that's devoted to the principle of liberty has within its boundaries this system of slavery that isn't going away and that, in fact, is growing larger and larger and more and more important every day. Sorry, it's really long. You mentioned that um, one lesson that we take from the abolitionist movement is that we cannot yield in our principles. Um, but you also mentioned that uh, when they got into the business of national politics, the soil party, etc. They didn't advocate for abolitionism or even equal rights for uh, blacks, but for a, a moderated position. So does that suggest that um, as a movement, as we need to on our principles, however, depending on the channels in which we're translating those principles into concrete goals and demands, we may need to moderate those? That's a really great question. Uh, I mean, your question was good. Uh, <laughs> I'm mine. Since, no, no, I'm sorry, no, Simon's question was not very good. Though it was asked in a lovely accent. Uh, no, I mean, that, that, uh, it seems to me that this is sort of the core question, right? And um, the answer is that there's no answer, right? There's, there's, there, I, I can give you six different answers to that question, and I can back all of them up with a variety of different, I think, particularly compelling pieces of evidence. What I would say to you is that from where I sit, and, and you know, you got to understand that from where I sit is a position of extraordinary privilege, right? I don't want a revolution. I've got tenure. Uh, a, a, a revolution doesn't serve my interests. But, but what I would say is that I think that social movements are at their best when they are elastic. When, when they have on their margins people who are willing to adopt a variety of different tactics, particularly in the short term, in order to serve long-term strategic goals. And so, 
I think that it was useful that there were those abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass, who was considered, because of the color of his skin, extraordinarily scary and radical <laughs> by most onlookers. But Frederick Douglass supported Abraham Lincoln. Frederick Douglass supported the Republican Party. Meanwhile, there were white abolitionists who were far more <laughs> radical than Frederick Douglass who wanted to burn the Constitution, and who did, because it had embedded in it certain codicils that allowed for the existence of slavery. And so I think abolitionism, looking back, was so successful in some ways because it fragments, because it has a number of different wings, each of which appeal to a different constituency, because it has women who are reaching out to other women, because it has African-American leaders who, as I said, have a particular kind of moral authority because of their experiences. Because it has people who are, who are willing to compromise around certain issues, and because it has those who never will. But again, at its core, it has this principle, which is that <coughs> slavery must be eradicated. It, it, the, 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 the fights are always on the margins. How quickly who should be responsible, who should be speaking, what means should be used, but no one is ever arguing over whether it should happen. I got a question, Art. Oh. <laughs> are you going you know, to like, carry children in here and, have, and, and, and have like performing animals? <laughs> <laughs> we don't all do that either, but. No, like, you, you talked about people like Harriet Beecher Stowe, Stowe, Stowe writing about the evils of slavery, but on the other hand, there are plenty of writers and commentators talking about the benefits of slavery. Sure. So how did the abolitionist movement deal with the Rush Limbaugh's, the Glenn Becks of it today? How did they about the counter-argument? Um, uh, so again, this is a long answer. Uh, let me just see if I can make it short. Um, very quickly, uh, what happens is that, uh, starting really in the 1830s, uh, the necessary evil uh, argument disappears. Um, Southerners who, who really, uh, I shouldn't just say Southerners, slaveholders in both the North and the South, who through the 1820s, uh, if not all of them, many, most of them are willing to describe slavery as a necessary evil, gradually uh, uh, move away from that position and begin describing it as a positive good. Uh, and they do this because they feel pressure from abolitionists, uh, because they feel like they need to react to the fact that they're being described as immoral and unpatriotic. And, and these people who are advocating the positive good, are, good argument, these are right? What we're talking about are people owning other people. And this is what abolitionists are extraordinarily good at underscoring. They, they, they continually point to the human face of slavery, and this is where, uh, again, going back to your question, which really was good, uh, and, and asked in non-accented American English, uh, they, they continually uh, point to, uh, to, to free people, to people who have experienced slavery and have come through that ordeal, and they point to their basic humanity and say, look, how can you talk about enslaving uh, uh, actual human beings? What are you doing? <laughs> so it really is a moral appeal, and that's the uh, and 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 to some extent, you know, that's the appeal that I I think really uh, it, it, where I don't want to see. Actually, I'll, here's what I'll say. I don't know how many of you saw this, but the other day, a, a, a relatively famous historian, which is to say that <laughs> someone that no one's ever heard of before, uh, named Doug Brinkley. Um, Douglas Brinkley, who's at Rice University, got into a, a, a sort of shouting match with Senator Don Young of Alaska. Did any of you see this? Uh, this uh, he was, he was, he, he was, uh, d d there were hearings in the Senate about the, the, uh, the, the what was it called? The, the wildlife refuge. Uh, what's that? Thank you. The Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. Yeah. Uh, and, and Douglas Brinkley was there testifying that this land should be kept sacrosanct and set aside, and Don Young, who's a senator from Alaska, and, and he's in the hip pocket of big oil, uh, said that, that uh, kept interrupting Brinkley, and Brinkley uh, finally got fed up with this, and, and, he, uh, and he started scolding, started shouting at Don Young, but rather than saying to him, uh, shame on you, rather than shaming him, he began talking about his educational pedigree, 
you know, he, he'd be, well, you couldn't even graduate from a community college. Well, you know, that's not useful. You know, what you want to do to people like the Glenn Becks, I think, the people of Rush Limbaugh, is you want to, you want to shame these people. These are shameful characters. I mean, the most powerful thing, from my perspective, that has the most powerful image that has come out of the recent events on this campus, I think almost everyone would agree, is not the horrifying image of Officer Pike pepper spraying students. This is an image that I, I think for most of us can't even stomach this. The most powerful image is watching the chancellor oh, yeah. walk down a row of students who are causing her to feel extraordinary shame because of her actions. That's moral authority. <laughs> And to me, again, a, a sort of milk toast moderate with tenure, you know, right, I don't want my back against the wall, thanks. Uh, that's the sort of thing that I think is most common. I can be done. No, that's good. <laughs> that's great. Well, if you want more of these lectures, Alan Taylor is speaking on the granddaddy of American descent, the American Revolution at 6 o'clock here. Holly Cooper from the Law School is speaking on prisoners' rights over history. She's speaking somewhere in the East Ward at 7. And then these, these um, lecture series are doing the rounds. There are speakers throughout the world.